to Yesterday Today. I'm Jake, and this is McLean, and we are continuing Halloween Month on the podcast. It's still not really named. We, we, we went through a variety of potential names for it. Spooktober, Shocktober, Spooky Sea. There's just nothing good. I don't know. It's, it's hard, man. It's hard to name. Uh, Jack-O-Lantern uh, Festival was a name that was bandied about. Har- harvest party if we're if we're a church trying to pretend it's not halloween but we we know full well what's going on here that was that was considered um it was and in addition to this i've made a terrible mistake today mclean you know our janitor sydney i'm intimately familiar he um is is he still going by phd by the way or no, I think he's given that oh, up. Okay. You see, earlier today, glad to hear. Um, I was making some coffee in the uh, in the little kitchen area out there, and he was mopping the floor. And I thought it would be funny. You know, this was, you know, the the stupid actions. You know, hindsight is twenty twenty. I thought it'd be funny to joke around with them and tell them the uh, this building was haunted. Okay, that doesn't sound. Too... Turns out he takes that very seriously. Uh, like so, like so, like how serious. He said something about procuring his ghost hunting equipment from home, and he would be back in a bit. I'm not liking what I'm hearing right now. That does not sound good, actually. At first, I thought this could be funny. I thought maybe it'd make a nice theme for the show, huh? I don't think it's going to be funny. I think this is going to be migraine-inducing, potentially. Now, it depends on how we play this, McLean. This could go many ways. I I don't know yet. Let's, Let's try to be positive about this. I'm gonna make. I'm choosing. I'm choosing to maintain a positive attitude. And while I maintain that positive attitude, I think we should start off with some Halloween-themed episodes of Old Time Radio. And to begin with, an episode of the Jack Benny program. So here this is, and um, we're gonna batten down the hatches and hope. Uh, so it'll all be fine. I don't fine. know, man. I just the the dude's just always looking for an excuse to burn this place down or something. It's just hey, terrible, it'll McLean. Blow over, I don't you like know. it. Look, if he's not raising a new breed of termites in the closet, he's making cheese in the basement. I I don't know if hey, I can work hey, here anymore, man. man. I'm losing it. I lost it. my mind in a corn maze last week. After We stayed there in three days. Yeah, I think I this is going to be nothing compared to that. This is more of a slow burn, McLean. It's not the intensity of one specific incident. It's the day in, day out. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, I see well, what we can talk about this while the show is playing. Sorry. Jack Benny. The Jell-O program brought to you by Jell-O and Jell-O Pudding, starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens a program with Mama. Now at last, the gelatin dessert that gives you all the flavor. It's the new Jell-O, the gelatin dessert that keeps all of its full original flavor no matter how long it remains in the package. Up until now, gelatin desserts constantly faded in flavor while waiting to be used, lost much of their real taste and tingle. But the new Jell-O is different. Today, Jell-O's deep, vivid richness is locked right into the tiny Jell-O particles where time can't touch it. Jell-O loses nothing on its way to you. It comes out of the package as rich and full-flavored as it went in. Just prove it for yourself. Open a package of Jell-O. Notice that there's no heavy, fruity aroma, no sign of escaping flavor. It's there in all its thrilling goodness. Order several packages tomorrow, and look for the big red letters on the box, so that you're sure it's the one and only Jell-O. In Jell-O, the flavor never goes away. We put it in, and it's there to stay. played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, at this time, we would like to turn the clock back to last Friday night and show you what happened when Jack and the rest of our gang went out and celebrated Halloween. The time, 7.30 Friday evening. The place, Jack's house in Beverly Hills. Take it away. I don't want to set the world on fire. Rochester. I just want to go where I can get dough. 
Rochester, stop complaining in rhythm and help me get into my Halloween costume. The gang will be here any minute. Hand me those horns. Here you are. Pardon the ignorance, boss, but what character are you struggling to convey? <laughs> my costume is very obvious. I've got on red underwear, a long tail, horns, and I'm carrying a pitchfork. Now, who am I? The man from the finance company. <laughs> I am not. I'm the devil. Now, hand me that mirror. Here you are. Thanks. No, I don't like this effect. These darn horns keep slipping slipping over to one side. The horns are all right. It's your toupee that slips. (laughs) Something wrong there. I don't know why I picked out a devil costume anyway. Of course, I bought this pair of horns. I should use them. Why don't you put one of them on your nose and go as a rhinoceros? (laughs) No, I can't do that. Phil Harris is coming as Frank Buck, and he'd shoot me. (laughs) He'd love the excuse. I wonder if this tail is too long here. See who's at the door, Rochester. Yes, sir. Come in. I could have done that myself. (laughs) Rochester, when I tell you... Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. Mary, this is Halloween. I thought you were going to dress up tonight. Where's your costume? I've got it on. I'm Pocahontas. Pocahontas? In a mink coat? John Smith was nice to me. (laughs) Oh, you're a wampum digger, eh? (laughs) Well, at least stick a feather in your hair. Make it believable. Say, what do you think of my outfit, Mary? Don't I look like the devil? Always. (laughs) You mean my costume. I'm supposed to be Satan. Did you see my horns? Well, straighten up. You look like a toad. (laughs) Who ever heard of a red toad? Say, boss, I'm going to a masquerade party tonight myself. You are, Rochester? What are you going to be? I'm going to close my eyes and go as a Smith Brothers cough drop. (laughs) Well, that's not a bad idea. Say, Rochester, why don't you keep one eye open and go as a period? (laughs) How's that? I better keep both eyes open. My lady friends are over. All right, do as you please. Jack, what are we going to do tonight? Where are we going? I got it all figured out. Listen to this. First, we'll go to Claudette Colbert's house, and then I'll take a piece of soap and write, Claudette loves Jack all over her window. Oh, you did that last year, and she came out and wrote, Jack who? (laughs) Well, this time she'll know Jack who. When Claudette comes out of the house, I'm going to grab her and give her a kiss. There's only one guy kisses like Benny. You don't have to tell me, dead lips. Mary, I'm going to give you a good jab with my pitchfork if you don't look out. Well, anyway, after we live Claudette... Come in, come in. Well, look what's hopping through the door. For Pete's sake, what an outfit. Hello, Jack, Mary. Hello, Don. What are you supposed to be? Why, can't you tell? I'm a kangaroo. Well, sure enough, you certainly look realistic, Don, with those long ears sticking up in that great big pouch. <laughs> but say... Say, I thought Dennis was coming with you. Where is the kid? (laughs) Peekaboo! Well, I'll be darned, a baby kangaroo. (laughs) Here, climb... Uh, Climb out, kid. Here, I'll help you. Thanks, Mr. Benny. Imagine coming as a little kangaroo. You know, I was going to come as a floor lamp. A floor lamp? Yeah, but when I screwed the bulbs in my ears, they wouldn't light up. (laughs) Oh, that's terrible. Maybe I ought to see a doctor. (laughs) Dennis, you're not supposed to light up. (laughs) You know, Mary... (laughs) Someday I'll have to have a talk with that kid. By the way, Jack, isn't Phil going to join us tonight? Yeah, he'll drop by as soon as he finishes night school. Say, Dennis, while we're waiting around for him, let's hear that song you're going to do on the program Sunday. Yeah, get over to the piano, kid. Okay. Oh, say, Rochester, did you ask our boarder, Mr. Billingsley, to tune the piano? He's very good at it, you know. We should have never let him monkey with it, boss. Oh, what's he done now? That man's crazy. He cleaned the piano keys with dental floors. (laughs) Oh, Mr. Billingsley must think he's a dentist again. It's a fine way to clean piano keys. He said the black ones were decayed, so he pulled them out. (laughs) 
Oh, my goodness. He broke eight needles trying to give the leg Novocaine. <laughs> well, it's my own fault, I guess. Well, do the best you can, Dennis. Go ahead. Wait a minute, I'll answer it. Hello? Oh, hello, Phil. Are you still at night school? We're waiting for you. What? She's keeping you after school. What happened, Jack? Well, Phil got a zero in spelling, so he gave the teacher a hot foot. <laughs> Look, Phil, is your teacher anywhere near the phone? Well, well, tell her your father wants to talk to her. Yeah, yeah, your father. What are you going to do, Jack? I'm going to pretend to be Phil's father. You know, I'll talk like an old rube. Well, you got the right underwear for it. <laughs> Quiet now, don't mix me up. Hello? Oh, hello, miss. This is Twitch Harris Sr. talking. <laughs> now, look, ma'am, I got to see my boy Philip right away, so I wish you'd let him off tonight. I'll write you a note explaining everything. I said I'd write you a note. <laughs> That's a good one. What'd she say? She wants to know how come I can write and Phil can't. <laughs> Well, okay, thanks a lot, ma'am. Say, what are you doing later? <laughs> well, you can't shoot a man for trying. <laughs> Goodbye. Well, it's all set, fellas. Phil will be here pretty soon. You know that teacher sure had a sweet voice. I could kind of go for her. But, Jack, you don't even know what she looks like. Anything he gets is gravy. <laughs> I don't know about that, sister. Sing, Dennis. See this pitchfork, Mary? You're going to get it. Now, you get it. Dennis, that song ought to go over swell Sunday. Thanks, Mr. Benny. Can I have something to eat? Yeah, I'm hungry, too. Haven't you got any sandwiches? I've got donuts and cider. That's all you're supposed to have on Halloween. Uh, bring in the donuts, Rochester. They're right here, boss. Oh, yes. Here, have a donut, Mary. They're nice and fresh. I made them myself. Jeepers, look at the size of the holes you got in them. <laughs> Never mind. They look like ladies' garters. <laughs> Quiet, will you? Oh, what she said. <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> no use waiting. I gotta have a talk with that kid. 
<laughs> Here, Don. Don, have a donut. Have a donut and some of this sweet cider. Thanks. <laughs> I think I'll have a glass of that myself. Pretty strong, Jack. Strong? Let me taste this. Well, I'll be darned. Oh, Rochester! <laughs> yes, boy! <laughs> what did you put in this cider? A little Central Avenue vitamin! <laughs> There's gin in there! Now... Now throw that cider out the window. You ain't gonna throw mine out. Dennis, you're not drinking any hard cider. You're a baby kangaroo. Oh, I can't hop on milk. <laughs> Let Don hop. Now you get back in that pouch. Okay. See you later, fellas. <laughs> I'll stay there. Gee, I, I wish Phil would get here so we can go oh, ahead. Oh, uh, Jack, look who's coming. Where? Oh, yes, it's Mr. Billingsley. Look, he's dressed like Marie Antoinette. Yeah. Oh, uh, oh, hello, Mr. Billingsley. Good evening, Mr. Benny. Having a little party, I see. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, by the way, Mr. Billingsley, uh, you're dressed as Marie Antoinette. Are you going to a masquerade? No, my head aches, so I'm going to have it cut off. <laughs> oh. Oh, oh I, I thought you were celebrating Halloween like we are. You see, I'm Satan... And Miss Livingston is Pocahontas, and Mr. Wilson is a kangaroo. I used to be an alligator once, and now I'm an old bag. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> well, uh, see you later. Good night, Mr. Benny. Good night. That's one way to look at it. <laughs> hmm. Strange fellow. The other morning for breakfast, he swallowed a raw egg and then drank boiling water for three minutes. <laughs> I don't know. Well, there's Phil. Come on in, Phil. Hi, you Jackson. Hello, everybody. Oh, hello, hello, Phil. Hello. Hi, hi. Hi. I'm glad you got here, Phil. We want to get going. I'm sorry, but I didn't have time to put no costume on. Don't worry, your tailor takes care of that. <laughs> Hey, Phil, uh, what, uh, what happened between you and the teacher? Oh, she got mad at me when we were having our spelling lesson. Oh, what was the trouble? She asked me to spell Pomeranian. Pomeranian? So I said, D-O-G, take it or leave it. <laughs> well, at least you knew Pomeranian was a dog. That's something, huh? Well, we're all here, so come on, fellas, let's go. Hey, Don, you put on a lot of weight since last week. That's Dennis. It's a long story. <laughs> Uh, come on, everybody, let's go. Oh, Rochester, Rochester, before you leave, be sure and lock the garage so that nobody damages the Maxwell. Okay. Remember last year, some kid got in there and turned it over. Yeah, we drove around for three days without even noticing. <laughs> I noticed it. It was bumpy as anything. All right, this way, fellas. We'll all go out the side door. Oh, that's fine. Right. Boy, we really, we really have fun tonight. You know, kids, first we'll go next door to Ronald Coleman's house. See? And then we'll Jack, go... Jack, here comes that little boy you hired as a gag man. Let's take him along. Oh, Belly Laugh Barton, eh? <laughs> ah, hello, kid. Hello, Mr. Benny. Say, Belly, do you uh, want to go out with us tonight? We're going to ring doorbells and raise the dickens. You're a little adolescent, aren't you, bub? <laughs> Oh, we'll enjoy ourselves. Sorry you won't come along. By the way, how's the uh, program coming along for Sunday? If I tell you, you won't have any fun tonight. <laughs> well, get busy and concentrate. Come on, fellas. Now, I'll tell you what, kids. First, we'll sneak across the lawn to Ronald Coleman's house and put some white paint on the doorknob, see? Then we'll ring the bell, and when he comes out, we'll run like the dickens. <laughs>
see. I, I rang Coleman's bell three times. Why doesn't he come out? Maybe he went to a party or something. Couldn't be a big party or I'd have been invited. <laughs> Ronnie and I attend the same affairs. Only he doesn't have to crawl in the window. <laughs> well, these Hollywood parties, who knows whether you got an invitation or not. <laughs> hey, fellas, I've got an idea. As long as Coleman isn't home, let's take this beautiful sundial here and put it over on my front lawn. His sundial? Yeah, it'll be a swell gag. Three years ago, you took his flagpole. When's the gag over? <laughs> oh, get in the Halloween spirit, will you? Come on, fellas, give me a hand with this dial. Hey, Jack, look. There's a policeman walking by the house. A policeman? Uh-oh. Hello there. Is that you, Mr. Coleman? Get this, fellas. Uh, right, Joe. Thanks for asking, old boy. Terribly decent of you. Good night. Tip, tip. <laughs> I, I I certainly fooled the blighter. Take that donut out of your eye. You're not Coleman anymore. <laughs> oh, yes. Say, fellas, we'll never budge this sundial. It's too heavy. I'll have to phone for some movers. <laughs> I'll tell you what, though. Look, let's, let's go over to Basil Rathbone's. Does he live near here, Jackson? Yeah, right past my house on the other side of the street. Come on. Ooh. I'm this pale I keep tripping on. <laughs> hmm, look at that light in my kitchen. Belly lap is in there eating me out of house and home. <laughs> All the writers with ulcers, and I had to get him. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> oh, Jack, look at this. Where? Hey, wait a minute. Who wrote this on my sidewalk? Jell-O has that new locked-in flavor. The flavor never goes away. We put it in and it's there to stay. Who did this? Don't look at me. Kangaroos can't write. <laughs> oh, yeah? Now, Don, you go get a rag and wipe it off. I'll tell the sponsor. All right, you big fat paddle tail. Leave it there. <laughs> now, follow me. Follow me across the street, fellas. Oh, we'll go to Rathbone's house. Quiet now. He will fix him good. Which house is it, Jackson? Wait a minute. I don't know whether this is Rathbone's house or the next one. I think it's this one. No, no, it's the next one. This is where Charles Boyer lives. Oh, that's right. Say, let's pull some gag on him. Yeah, maybe he's got a sundial we can lift. <laughs> no, I'll just sneak up and ring his doorbell. Wait here, fellas. Hey, Jackson, Nick, here comes that cop again. Uh-oh. Hello there. Is that you, Mr. Boyer? Here I go again, fellas. Oh, uh, good evening, officer. <laughs> Beautiful night. Beautiful. Yes, it is. Good night, Mr. Boyer. Bon Sawyer. <laughs> hmm. Lucky I can speak French. <laughs> hey, Jack, let's get away from here. The policeman's liable to come back. He might have said, I'll tell you what. Let's go through this driveway and sneak over to Bathroom's backyard. Now, follow me, fellas. Everybody quiet. <laughs> Well, here we are. Gee, it's dark tonight. Hey, where did Phil disappear to? I don't know. Where is he, Don? He was with us a minute ago. Have you seen him, Dennis? He's not in here. <laughs> Of course not. Here he comes now. Where have you been, Phil? Boy, am I wet. Why didn't you tell me that Rathbone had a swimming pool? Well, why don't you watch where you're going? I swallowed enough water to last me the rest of my life. Well, it didn't hurt you to go on the wagon, even for a second. <laughs> now, wait here, kids. I'm going up and knock on the door. When Rathbone comes out, hide in the bushes. Wow, will he be furious? Oh, be careful now, Jack. Don't worry about me. Now, quiet. Get ready, fellas. Yahoo! <laughs> Darn those milk bottles. <laughs> I hope I didn't cut myself. Am I bleeding, Mary? With what? <laughs> With blood, I've got it. 
The idea of leaving... Where's the light just went on, Jack? Quick, pick me up. Here comes Rappel. Quiet, everybody. Yes, yes, yes. Who's there? Anybody there? I say, is anybody there? Ah, must be some of those Halloween pranksters. Now, look here, you children. I don't want any more of this disturbance. I've got to get up early in the morning. I'm making a picture. What a ham. <laughs> Why? Will I catch you around here again tonight? I'll give you all a sound good thrashing. Now, go away, all of you. Scat! <laughs> oh, boy, is he, is he burned up. Boy, am I going to make his life miserable tonight. Wait a minute. What do you got against Rathbone? Jack hates him because he can act. <laughs> That's all. I can see him imitate Boyer like I did. Now, fellas, this time I'm going to grab this big rock here and throw it up against the door. Oh, you can't take those steps again, eh, Daddy? <laughs> I can climb, only this will be more annoying. Now, here goes. I'm going to throw the rock. One. Phil, what are you doing back there? Nothing. Well, get away. <laughs> Two. Three. Go! Holy smoke, I broke a window. There goes the porch light again. Quick, fellas, run. He's coming out. Whoops. Well, I'll be... Hey, what is this? Come on, Jack, hurry! Run, run! I can't run. That darn Phil Harris tied my tail to this bush. <laughs> Gee, what a spot. I hope Rathbone doesn't see me. May I ever get my hands a little? Ah! Uh-huh. Who's hiding there? Who's in back of that bush? Hmm. Right now, I'd give $1,000 to be playing Salt Lake City. <laughs> Gee, here he comes. Well, may I inquire the name of the moron behind that mask who goes around breaking windows? Who are you? Gee. Come, 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 man. Speak up. Gosh. <laughs> ah, Basile, I'm only making the joke. It is me, Charles Boyer. Mr. Benny, your accent is revolting. <laughs> oh, 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 hello, Basil. Hello, how did you know it was me? You wore that same costume last Halloween when you tipped over my doghouse. Oh. I want that dog back. Where is he? <laughs> well, he had pups today. You're a fine Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Now, look, Basil, I'm sorry I threw that rock. It was an accident. Accident or no accident, you'll pay for that window. All right, all right, I'll pay for it. Darn Mr. This. Benny, what are you doing there? I'm untying my tail. What do you think I'm doing? <laughs> I'm very sorry about the whole thing, Basil. I won't bother you anymore tonight. I'll go and join my gang. I suppose you're going to continue this mischievous business. Well, well, listen, to tell you the truth, we're going over to Charles Lawton's house. You know those flower pots he's got on his front porch? yes. Well, listen, we're going to tip him over one by one. He'll go crazy when he hears that racket. I dare say, Lawton has a fierce temper. You said it. <laughs> well, so long, Basil. Happy Halloween. Goodbye. Lawton's house, eh? Flower pots. Wait a minute, Jack, old boy. I'm going with you. <laughs> what? You going to join us? I'll tell my wife. Uh, be back later, darling. Hey, fellas, have I got a surprise for you. Come on, Basil. Yippee! Here, listen, well, here's what we'll do. First, we'll go to Lawton's house. Then we'll go over to Claudette Colbert's and ring the doorbell, see? And when she comes out, I'll grab her and kiss her. And you can kiss her, too. Three cheers for three grand puddings. Jello chocolate, jello vanilla, and jello butterscotch pudding. Three delicious desserts made by the same people who make world famous jello. Jello puddings are puddings that even grandma would be proud to serve. Puddings that really taste homemade. Yet they take only just a few minutes to make. With jello puddings, all you have to do is add milk and bring to a boil. Then cool and serve. And there, almost before you know it, you've made the family a smooth, creamy pudding with a flavor unsurpassed by any pudding you ever tasted. So don't wait another day to try these luscious desserts. Try all three flavors real soon. Rich, mellow chocolate, creamy vanilla, and golden butterscotch. You'll find them all equally delightful. And you'll want to keep them handy on your pantry shelf all the time. Tomorrow, order Jell-O puddings and see if you don't say they're just like grandma's, only more so. This is 
is the last number of the fifth program in the current Jell-O series, and we will be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank Mr. Rathbone for appearing on our program tonight. Also at this time, I would like to announce that the motion picture drive for the community chess this year starts tomorrow, November 3rd. I'm sure that all of us here in Hollywood will do our bit, and I hope all of you will contribute to your local chapters. Good night, everybody. Welcome back to Sydney Snorthoff, Paranormal Investigator. Today, we have the case of the haunted studio building. It's a mysterious one, folks. It's a spooky one. Some may even say this is the biggest case of my career. It's actually the only case I've had in quite a while. The last one was the haunted veterinarian's office over on 6th Street until they threw me out of there because I was annoying the house cats. Anyway, what was I talking about? Oh, yes! You are the ones who are experiencing this ghostly phenomena, am I right? Sydney. Get that tape recorder out of my face. Please go away. I was up wrong. This is already much worse than the corn maze. Hey, 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 hold on now. Hold on now. You're the one that reported the ghost incident. Will you get that tape recorder out of my face, Sydney? Once again, this is all Jake's fault. Please, you're gonna break the thing doing that, man. Look, Sydney, I made that up. It was, I was just messing with you. There's no ghosts here. There's no hauntings. You don't have to do, what are you even doing? What is this? Oh, don't you know having a Paranormal Investigations podcast? Yeah. Yeah, I should have seen that one coming. Yeah, yeah, every week I investigate strange and mysterious happenings, tales of the unknown, instances you know, of intrigue. Sydney's got a lot of irons in the fire. He's He's got his cheese making, he breeds uh, mutant termites... He's got his paranormal Hey, I wasn't breeding termites, I was breeding ragweed. Look, I'm a man who wears many hats, okay? Makes sense when you consider uh, how clean he keeps the building, or lack thereof. Yeah, I'm, you know, I, I, I suspect the ghosts are uh, dirtying things up a bit behind the scenes. Ghosts can actually be very messy, you know? Oh yeah, I'm sure they're just tracking mud here all, all over. Oh yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a legitimate thing that happens with ghosts. Uh, anyway, if you guys will excuse me, I need to set up my uh, monitoring equipment right where you are recording right there because this is the best part of the room to capture the frequency that the ghosts communicate on. So I'm just going to put this tape recorder here. Sydney, Cow. please. That'll work. Jake, would you say this, where would this ranks on a scale of giant pots of cheese in the studio to... Giant termites we had to fight off. Like I wouldn't scale, say like, it's on the level of those yet, but it's definitely headache-inducing so far. All right, I just gotta run this wire past you. If you'll step aside, there, buddy. Step aside. All right, let's see if I get my my. Uh, yeah, no, this needs to go over here. I'll put that there. Uh, let's see here. This antenna kind of telescopes out, doesn't it? There we go. And that up there. Oh. Man, I got a lot of equipment. Um, hey, you guys want to help me move some stuff in from the truck? Nope. Not if you paid me. Yeah, we're just gonna, um, intro the next episode. This is uh, another episode of Suspense. It, um, it's actually very apropos. Uh, it's entitled... It's entitled Ghost Hunt. Oh, hey, that's what I'm doing! Yeah, yeah I know, Sydney. Oh. I know. I know. Anyway, um, I'm gonna need to be here overnight, by the way, so that I can monitor the, uh, the noises and capture them on cassette. Sydney, what, one question. Are you capturing ghost noises on cassette simply because you think it sounds spookier as opposed to capturing them on the digital recording device? Well, naturally. Yeah, yeah that's, yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, yeah, this is, yeah. uh, Suspense, Ghost Hunt, yeah. Now, Autolite and its 60,000 dealers and service stations present... Suspense! Tonight, Autolite brings you Mr. Ralph Edwards in Ghost Hunt, a suspense play produced and directed by Anton M. Leder. Friends, replace worn-out narrow-gap spark plugs with a set of those new wide-gap Autolite resistor spark plugs. 
Your motor will idle smoother, give better performance on leaner gas mixtures, actually save gas. These winning benefits are all made possible by a newly developed Autolite 10,000 ohm resistor built right into every Autolite resistor spark plug, making practical a wider spark gap setting. And that's what does the trick. What's more, Autolite resistor spark plugs with this exclusive Autolite resistor have greatly increased electrode life and cut down on radio and television interference. So folks, see your Autolite dealer and have him replace old, worn-out, narrow gap spark plugs with a set of the new Autolite resistor spark plugs. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. And also remember, the Autolite suspense show is now on television. Every Tuesday night in many parts of the country. And now, Autolite presents Ralph Edwards in a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Yeah, didn't that leave you high, huh? Left me feeling treetop tall. That was Louis Armstrong's I Can't Give You Anything But Love. And that's all we have time for on the Hot and Mellow Hour tonight. Yes, 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 this is Smiley Smith, your favorite disc jockey. I hope, I hope, booting the Hot and Mellow Hour home for this evening. I'll be back again tomorrow night, minus the music, but with a little surprise for you. Tomorrow night, Friday night, as you know, is stunt night here at station WXP. And have I got a stunt for you. Last week, if you remember, I planted my wire recorder in the steam room at a lady's Turkish bath and let you listen in on the playback, remember? <laughs> well, tonight, as soon as I leave the studio, do you know where I'm going? Hmm? Your friend Smiley is going to spend the night in a haunted house on a spook hunt. You heard me, a spook hunt in a haunted house. I'm bringing my little old wire recorder along with me, and if you tune in tomorrow evening at this time, you'll learn what it's like to spend a night in a haunted house. Ain't that something? <laughs> yeah. A real haunted house. No kidding. Four people are known to have committed suicide there. So tune in tomorrow night and share a real thrill with your old pal Smiley, I must be crazy, Smith. Good night. <laughs> Care for a cigar, Mr. Thorpe? I got some cigars in the dash there. No. Well, no reason for you to carry a chip on your shoulder, Mr. Thorpe. Oh, really? Well, I don't like this fool stunt. Well, I don't see it as a fool stunt at all. I really don't. I think it's the only way you're going to unload this house. Ordinary selling methods won't work in a case like this. Now, don't forget the reputation saddling this house. Four suicides since 1939. You know what people call it. The death trap. Yes. It's a lot of nonsense. Sure, but try to convince people of that. Anyway, when this disc jockey offered me this chance to kill all the rumors about the death or about the property, I just naturally jumped and took him up at it. Especially since it don't cost a cent. You sure about that? I'm not liable for a penny. Not a cent. We're doing him a favor letting him use the place, he said. Thank me for the chance last night when I drove him out here. So one hand washes the other, as the feller says. He got a chance to pull off a stunt, and the wire recording will prove the people the property is A number one, and we increase the chance of selling the place. Well, as long as it doesn't cost me anything. Not a thing. He's using his own recorder, and I'm paying for the rental of a couple of walkie-talkies he hooked up to it. Well, uh, what about this, uh, Reed? Does he charge anything? Mm, he comes gratis, too. Mm. Dr. Reed is a, uh, whatchamacallit, a psychic investigator. Belongs to a couple of societies that do nothing but hunt ghosts. <laughs> He showed me articles he's written about it in the magazine. Uh -huh. Well, here's the house. Yeah, looks real nice in the sunshine, don't it? Yeah, man, smell that sea breeze. You don't have to sell me. Well, let them know we're here. Yeah, probably asleep up all night and everything. Why don't they come out? Do you think they've gone? Well, I told them last night I'd pick them up around 11. Uh, Smith! Smith! Hey, Smiley! Dr. Reed! Yeah, fast asleep, I guess. We better go in and wake him up. Of course, they may have taken the bus back to town. No, oh, no, no. It's a two-mile hike to the main highway.
Uh, Smith! Hey, uh, Smiley. Where are you? Wake up. You don't suppose, uh, do you? Oh, no, no. Uh, Smith! Uh, Dr. Reed! What's that, that, uh, clicking noise from in there? Well, that's his wire recorder. He left it running. Well, these machines cost a lot of money. Doesn't he care if he uses up his batteries? Well, where is he? And where's this reed? Maybe they're upstairs. Uh, Smith! Hey! Anybody home? They must have walked to the highway and taken the bus. Well, he wouldn't have left these machines. Well, where are they, then? Where are they? Now, now, don't get excited, Mr. Thorpe. Don't tell me not to get excited. If something's happened to them in my house, I'm liable. Well, you try this side. I'll try that one. All right. Uh, Smith. Hey, Smiley. Smith. Smith. Oh. McDonald, come here. No, what? What it? Oh. No. Reed. Dr. Reed. No, no, don't touch him, Mr. Thorpe. You'll get your hands off. Look. Blood. Is he dead? I can still feel his pulse. We better get him to hospital fast. for a cigar, Mr. Thorpe? No, no, thanks. Well, why not try to relax? The nurse said Reed would be all right as soon as he's had a blood transfusion. You told the radio station to be sure and call us as soon as they had any word about Smith? Yes, I told him. Uh, why don't you sit down? No, oh, I'm all at sixes and sevens. What do you suppose happened out there last night? Uh, we're going to know in just a second, just as soon as I can get this, this recorder set up. You don't suppose Smith and Reed got into a fight, do you? Yeah, there. Huh? A fight? I don't know. Well, what's wrong? Won't it work? Yeah, it works. Uh, take it easy. One, two, three. Testing. One, two, three. There. Testing. Listen. One, two, three. All set, Dr. Reed? Mr. McDonald? Hey? Okay, here we go. <clears throat> this is Smiley Smith speaking. Smiley Smith, the ghost hunter. I don't know whether to hope this will turn out to be a success for the sake of the program or a failure for my own sake. Anyway, all the preparations have been made now, and it's up to the spooks. I better tell you where we are. Right now, we're standing on the lawn of a house about 12 miles above Malibu Beach. The ocean is 100 feet away, straight down. The house is perched on a cliff, and there's a sheer drop of about 100 feet right into the old Pacific. Maybe you can hear the surf pounding. I'll turn up the volume. You hear it? Now... I'm going to have you meet two gentlemen who are here with me. Incidentally, we're the only people around for miles and miles. First, I'd like you to meet Dr. Clarence Reed of the British and American Psychical Research Guilds. Dr. Reed is a famous investigator of uh, psychic phenomena, and I'm very honored to be associated with him on this ghost hunt. He's smiling in an embarrassed sort of way. You're much too kind, Mr. Smith. Dr. Reed has conducted experiments in this field with such great believers in spiritualism as Oliver Lodge and Arthur Conan Doyle. He looks a bit like Santa Claus. He's short and stocky. You don't object, do you, Dr. Reed? Hmm? Uh, no, 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 indeed. And he has a magnificent white beard, a truly great beaver. Dr. Reed is so enthusiastic about ghost hunting that he got out of a sick bed this evening to be with us. Excuse me. My lungs. Mm -hmm. I was uh, gassed in the First World War. Yeah. Uh, anyway, Dr. Reed and I are here on the lawn looking at the house. Can't see much. It's around, oh, 11 p.m. now. Seems to be a rambling sort of house, two stories high. Since it was built, there have been four suicides here. Is that right? Uh, that's right. Uh, in, into the mic, please. Oh, yeah. uh, <clears throat> four suicides since 1939. I better tell them who you are so they won't think you're a ghost. Eh? Standing with the doc and me is a real estate agent, Mr. Charles McDonald. He handles this property, and he can tell you a lot more about it than I can. Well, the house was built by a man named Marcus, Toby Marcus, an orange grower. Built the house as a wedding present for his wife. A month after they moved in, she took her own life. On the day of her funeral, he committed suicide the same way. There have been two other cases since then, and did, I... Did they all uh, jump into the ocean? Yeah, yeah, all four of them, right over there. Yeah. The last one was actually seen doing it about three years ago. He was seen running like all get out the edge of the cliff, and he was shouting and laughing and yelling as though there was people at his side running right along with him. You kidding? No, it's a fact. 
He was laughing and yelling and running, and when he got to the edge, uh, right over there, huh? he jumped and never came above water. <laughs> as good an argument against cold baths as ever I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, since then, people just refuse to live in this house. Silly, I call it. Anyway, if you and Dr. Reed find any sign of a spook, I'll advise the owner to pull the house down and rebuild. But if you don't find anything, I'm hoping this will convince folks that here's a real buy. Yeah, okay, Mr. Smith, you and the doctor are on your own. I'll be by in the morning to pick you up around 11. Goodbye, Mr. McDonald. I hope yeah. there's something left for you to pick up in the morning. <laughs> well, it's almost pitch black, folks, and I guess Dr. Reed and I ought to begin. I don't believe in ghosts, never have, but what I say is this. If you're dead set on looking for them, this is a dandy place to do it. So long! Mr. McDonald just checked out, and then there were two. Well, three. Oh, my dog, yeah. Uh, folks, I have my dog, Jeff, with me. He's a wire-haired terrier, three years of age, and he can talk. Yeah, say hello, Jeff. Come on, Jeff, say hello. Come on. Well, uh, anyway, he's a wire-haired terrier, and he's three years old. Uh, shall we go inside now, Dr. Reed? I was about to suggest it. Now, uh, how do we hunt ghosts, Doctor? How do we do it, huh? No, we don't really hunt them. If there should be any in the house, they will come to us. Oh, how cozy. And please, not ghosts. Do not refer to them as ghosts. We know them as apparitions. I'll remember. I've no desire to hurt their feelings. Where ghosts are concerned, I say live and let live. <laughs> well, we've opened the front door now. Maybe you heard the hinge squeak a little. Now we're standing here looking in. Can't see much. <laughs> Smells sort of musty and damp. The... What's the matter, Jeff? What's the matter, boy? Jeff. Oh, come on now. Come on. My dog seems to object to entering this house. He has all four feet braced and he's straining against the leash. Perhaps he senses something we don't. Like apparitions, maybe? Perhaps. It's not unusual. Animals lack the veneer of sophistication we humans possess and are more sensitive to such ammunition. Yeah, come on, Jeff. Now, stop this nonsense. He probably smells a mouse or rat or something. Come on, Jeff. We're going in whether you like it or not. Well, there's a short entrance hall, and over there at the end of it is a flight of stairs leading to the second floor. Jeff! And uh, over here at the left is what seems to be a large reception room. We're entering this large room now. There are windows over there, French windows, and through them I can see the ocean. The electricity hasn't been turned on, so all I have to see by is a flashlight. Not a very powerful one at that. Dr. Reed is now adjusting his walkie-talkie. It's hooked up to my recorder so that he can cut in while he's hunting and tell us what he's found. Here's a few words from Doc before he sets forth on his investigation through the house. Ladies and gentlemen... <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Mr. Smith has introduced me as a ghost hunter. He spoke, I think, in a spirit of skepticism and, and levity... I'd like to assure you all that my purposes here are serious. I have spent my entire life seeking reliable proof of the appearances of apparitions. Mm. Have you ever seen any, ever? I have seen phenomena which lead me to believe in the possibility of their existence, although I have never seen any. I account myself sensitive to the evidence of their existence. This house, for example, affects me profoundly. It doesn't seem to affect you in the same way. I'm not too happy about all this, if that's what you mean. You are not psychic and therefore not sensitive to these matters as I am. I imagine the question in the minds of those of you listening to us is, shall we find apparitions? I don't know. But I feel they are here and that they are evil. I sense danger. I shall soon know. Dr. Reed's leaving the room now to make a tour of the house. First thing I'm going to do is open the windows and let some fresh air in. Ah, it feels better already. Cooler, anyway. I know that. Out! What was... A bat, a, ba a bat just flew flew into the room. I, I think it's a bat, not a bird. I didn't actually see it, just its, its shadow as it fanned my face. There it is again. It touched me as it passed. Oh, oh, oh. Jeff, 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 come back here. Jeff, you fool dog, come back here. Dr. Reed? Dr. Reed? Dr. Reed! For suspense, Autolite is bringing you Mr. Ralph Edwards in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Hello, snap out of it. Huh? Oh, 
Oh, uh, I'm reading a letter about the new Wide Gap Autolite Resistor spark plugs, Hap. Oh. It's from Mrs. Clark Perry right here in Hollywood. She says, our 1948 station wagon has given constant trouble. Finally, the garage man said all the difficulty was spark plugs, and he installed a set of Autolite Resistor spark plugs. Now the car runs beautifully. The very first time my husband has been really pleased. Well, smart garage man. Smart people to take his advice. Hap, you know, as more and more people learn about wide gap, auto light resistor spark plugs, and how they make an engine idle smoother, give better performance on leaner gas mixtures, actually save on gas, why then more people will replace old, worn out, narrow gap spark plugs with sensational new wide gap auto light resistor spark plugs. Any more letters like that, Harlow? Plenty, Hap, plenty. Why, here's another one from New York City. Oh, uh, read it to me later, Harlow. We haven't time because here's suspense. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Ralph Edwards as Smiley Smith in Ghost Hunt, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Oh, oh, yeah. Jeff, Jeff, come back here. Jeff, you fool dog, come back here. Dr. Reed. Dr. Reed. Dr. Reed! Reed speaking. What is it, Smith? Uh, Jeff has run off. My dog, he he jumped through the window and ran off. Oh, so? I told you he sent something about this house, didn't I? Yeah, you want to come and see if you can determine what it was exactly that set him off? Uh, Soon. I'm making my way slowly up the stairs toward the second floor now. I'm halfway up. I'll be down with you soon. Uh, Folks, my dog's run away. You probably heard him howling. He jumped through the window and took off. Never did anything like that before. Frightened by the bat, I guess. Personally, alone here in this big room, I can understand how he must have felt. This isn't a cheerful spot by any means. I may not be psychic, but I sure have a feeling this house doesn't want us here. Read again. (coughs) Excuse me. I have something of great interest to report. I'm now standing in an alcove on the second floor trying to recover my breath. As I reached the head of the stairs, I felt what I think is a definite psychic manifestation. I felt suddenly as though I had been punched in the solar plexus. That's the only way I can describe it. At the same time, I began to perspire. Uh, My head is still swimming slightly, uh, and I have difficulty in swallowing. My pulse rate is around 110 in a minute. The sense of evil is very strong. I feel very, uh, what shall I say, profoundly depressed. Do you want me up there? Uh, No, I prefer to remain up here alone. The presence of a disbeliever such as you might interfere with my investigation. Folks, I'd like you to get a picture of what it's like here. It's very quiet, for one thing. I've never been in such a quiet place, and it's pretty dark. No light except my flashlight. Tell you what, you go now and douse all the lights you have on. Go ahead, put out the lights, and that'll give you a clearer feeling of how it is here with me. Go ahead, put out the lights. Hey, did did you hear that? (laughs) Real estate agent told me I'd probably hear rats and mice in the walls. I can certainly hear them now. Even you can hear them, I think. It's as though... Dr. Reed speaking... I've been working my way toward the front room, the one directly above the one in which Mr. Smith is now. The vibrations have become stronger and more and more pronounced as I approach it. I think I am on the verge of an important discovery. Important discovery. Did you get that? Now I can hear Dr. Reed moving about in the room above. I don't suppose you can. Have a try anyway, huh? Hear him? I hope he finishes his investigation soon because... Quite frankly, I'd like to get out of here. I can well imagine people becoming unhinged in this place. Right now, I find myself pretty jumpy. I'm not being very brave, am I? It's being alone in this room down here that does it. This, this darned old house, it's, it's a very, I mean, you know, the atmosphere, it's so very... I wish only to make this hurried report before continuing with the investigation in this room. I have carefully sounded out all the parts in this room, and the emanations are most strong from what appears to be a closet before which I am now standing. As soon as I open the door to this closet, I will have, I think, a thing of great interest to communicate. I find no key to the lock, and so I will attempt to remove the hinges with my penknife, and I will tell you what I find when I open it. I'll tell you what it would cost to get me to open that door. In the basement at Fort... There's that bat again. It seems to like me the way it keeps... Each time it passes, it touches my face or my neck with its wings. (laughs) Smelly things, bats... I don't suppose they bathe very often, if at all. I wonder how... Get away, you bat! That bat'll be the death of me. 
Yeah, it's like a jingle, isn't it? Battle be the death of me, the death of me, the death of me. Battle be the death of me. It isn't far from London. No, that isn't the way it goes. It's uh, come down to um, Q in lilac time, in lilac time, in lilac time. Come down to Q in lilac time. It isn't far. I haven't thought of that since I was a kid in grammar school. Gee, I had a lonely childhood when you come right down to it. I mean, oh, well, that's my affair, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. It well, certainly is. I have succeeded in removing the hinges to the door, and I find inside it is not a closet, but much larger. It is, I think, a dressing room. I have not yet been inside, but I am about to enter. Uh, what was I talking about? Uh, oh, yeah, bats. Well, the bat flying back and forth in this room is... Did you hear that? Did, did you hear it? Dr. Reed must have knocked something over in the dressing room. A chair, a chair, yeah, a heavy chair by the sound of it. The chair, or whatever it was, must have fallen right, right over my head. That's the way it sounded. I, I, I can see a small stain forming right on the ceiling, right, right over my head. <gasps> something ran across my foot just there. A rat, I think it was. I've always hated rats. Most people do, of course. That stain up there bothers me. It, it's gotten so big so soon. I think I'll take a chance and bother Reed and ask him what it is. Dr. Reed. Reed, can you hear me? Are you all right? Hello? Well, he didn't answer. I, I, I think he's just a little bit deaf. I think so. What do you suppose he's found, huh? I'm afraid this is rather dull for you listeners. I, I'm not finding it so, of course. <coughs> there. Hey, I, I heard him cough. Did you hear that cough? Hope he's all right. He's, he, he got out of a sick bed to come here this evening, you know. He was gassed in the First World War, and this place is beginning to get on my nerves a wee bit. Just a teensy-weensy bit. <coughs> Reed, speaking, I... <coughs> Hello? He switched off. That's a bad cough he's got. I feel so lonely. I've been alone so much in my life. Not so much now, of course, but when I was younger, I was alone so much of the time, you know, struggling to get ahead, living in a hall bedroom, wondering where my next meal is coming from. I get the blues just remembering it. Seem sad, young people having to spend so much time alone. Sad for old people, too, of course. I'm saying of course a lot. Of course I am. Hey, that stain on the ceiling, it's grown amazingly. It, it, it's actually beginning to drip. I mean, form bubbles. They'll start dropping soon. Colored bubbles, they seem to be. Odd-shaped stain, like a, a, a body lying on its back with its arms stretched out. <laughs> it's cheerful. <laughs> oh. I'll certainly advise Mr. McDonald to have this place pulled down. I'll go upstairs in a minute or two to see how Dr. Reed's making out. You know, listeners, I, I really believe I'd go completely crazy if I had to stay here much longer. Wears you down. That's exactly what it does. It wears you down. It's so close and musty in here. I feel sort of trapped. <laughs> Don't know why I said that. That's, that's what they call this place, you know, the death trap. There, what did I tell you? That stain started to drip drops, drip drops, drip drops, drip drops. Drip. I'll catch the next one in my hand. Let's <gasps> Reed! Dr. Reed! I'm, I'm going upstairs now, listeners. I'm, I'm afraid something has happened to Dr. Reed. I'm not kidding now. I mean, this is on the level. I, which room could it be now? Right, left, no, right, right. This is it, I think. Well, <laughs> oh, evening, gentlemen. And, and madam, I'm so glad to see you. I, I, I was just aching to see somebody. Anybody. I, I've been so lonely down there. Uh, what have you done with the doctor, huh? I know, I know he's been hurt. See the color of the bubble on my hand? What have you done with him? Make way, please, gentlemen, make way. Well, <laughs> well this isn't the, the funniest darn thing. <laughs> this can't be Dr. Reed lying here. He didn't have a red beard. Now, don't crowd me, gentlemen. Don't, don't crowd me, please. Huh? You want me to go where with you? You want me to do what? Speak up, gentlemen. To the cliffs. Down to the cliffs? You mean right now? <laughs> well, well, all right, if you'll come with me. I don't want to be alone anymore. You will come with me? All of you? All four of you? You too, ma'am? Oh, good. Come on, then. To the cliffs. To the cliffs. To the cliffs. To the... He jumped over the cliff. He jumped over the cliff, McDonald. He jumped over... The... Mr. McDonald, Mr. Thorpe, you may come in to see Dr. Reed now. What? Uh-huh. Dr. Reed is conscious. You may see him now. Is, is he able to talk? Just for a few minutes. In here. Come in. Come in, gentlemen. How are you, Dr. Reed? We've been waiting to see you. Yes. 
and I must apologize, gentlemen. I had a most unfortunate accident. Hemorrhage. A hemorrhage? Yes. My lungs, you know. Now, gentlemen... Hemorrhage? Dr. Reed, what happened in that house? What happened to Smith? We've just been listening to a playback of the recordings you made out there. Smith? Well, isn't he with you? We've just heard the recording, Dr. Reed. Smith jumped over the cliff into the ocean. Oh, that poor boy. Dr. Reed, will you please tell us what happened? We heard on the recording there were ghosts in that house. Ghosts? I didn't see any ghosts. But Smith, what about him? If he went over the cliff, it was fear that drove him over. But, Doc... Gentlemen, I didn't see any ghosts. As for that unfortunate young man, who can say now what he saw? Or thought he saw? <laughs> Thank you, Ralph Edwards, for displaying your versatility by appearing as guest star on Suspense. See, Harold, that Edwards does everything. Uh Uh-uh, half. No, does. Don't use that word on our Autolite show. Oh, come now, Harlow. I can make you use that word, as you call it. How? (laughs) Now, don't you say that Autolite resistor spark plugs make your car engine idle smoother? Yes, but... And your car gives better performance on leaner gas mixtures. Saves gas. Sure does. I mean, do. (laughs) I mean, does. Aren't we devils? (laughs) Ralph, you tricked me. Well, anyhow... It does my heart good to tell people that Autolite resistor spark plugs are ignition engineered by Autolite, which makes more than 400 products for cars, trucks, airplanes, and boats in 28 plants from coast to coast. Autolite also makes complete electrical systems for many makes of America's finest cars. Batteries, spark plugs, generators, starting motors, spark plug wire, battery cable, coils, distributors. All ignition engineered to fit together perfectly, Work together perfectly because they're a perfect team. The lifeline of your car. So, folks, don't accept electrical parts that are supposed to be as good. Remember, you're right with Autolite. And now here again is Ralph Edwards. I want to thank Tony Leader and his great cast of actors for helping to make my appearance on Suspense a very pleasant consequence. (laughs) Like all of you, I'm a great suspense fan, and I'm looking forward to next week when radio's outstanding theater of thrills brings you Joseph Cotton in The Day I Died, another gripping study in Suspense. Tonight's suspense play was adapted for radio by Walter Newman from an original story by H.R. Wakefield with music composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Bluskin. The entire production was under the direction of Anton M. Leader. Make it a point to listen next Thursday to Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Remember next Thursday, same time, here, Joseph Cotton in The Day I Died. You can buy Autolite resistor spark plugs, Autolite stay-full batteries, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. All right, welcome back to Yesterday Today. That was suspense you just heard. I'm trying to speak loudly to, to communicate with you over the sound of Sydney's equipment. Hey, watch it, buddy. I'm conducting a very scientific, very important... It's a rain. Oh, hold on. I got something. I got something. South wind 5 to 10 miles an hour. Partly Sydney, that's a weather radio. Hey, this is delicate equipment. Don't turn it off. Give me that. Sydney, how on earth is a weather radio part of your ghost hunting equipment? So here's the thing. Ghosts will frequently communicate via radio waves, and you can catch them between stations. They're what's known as phantom stations, where you can pick up the frequencies of the dearly departed in between your FM and your AM and your weather band. You get the ghost band, or GB as we in the biz call it. Sydney, you've said some pretty dumb things in the past. Quiet, quiet, quiet. Nah, he's gone. I have something there, guys. 
Jeez Louise, this investigation's gonna take you, longer than I thought. It was the weatherman. That's, the, that's not even the weatherman. That was like the weird robot voice thing they use. Weird robot voice thing they use in your world? Possible poltergeist in mine? Who's to say? <sighs> All right, I'm gonna go do a preliminary sweep of the other room, gentlemen. While Cindy goes and does that, our next episode is of the Archie Andrews Show. It's a, it's a classic one I have fond memories of as a kid listening to it. It's the Halloween Party. <laughs> Right away, Jughead. It's a matter of life or death. Oh, relax, Archie. Relax. Yes, here he is again, the youngster. Millions of readers of Archie Comics magazine know and love so well. Brought to you by Swift and Company, makers of Swift's Brookfield Sausage, Archie Andrews, and all his gang. <laughs> Hear that, folks? You're listening to the actual sound of two delicious links of Swift's Brookfield Sausage sizzling in the skillet. A sound that's an appetizing invitation to enjoy America's favorite pork sausage, Swift's Brookfield Sausage. Enjoy Swift's Brookfield Sausage for breakfast often. For nutritionists agree that we should all eat a good, nourishing breakfast. And Swift's Brookfield Sausage is packed with plenty of early morning energy, B vitamins and proteins to help you start the day with pep and vigor. Made of carefully selected pure, fresh pork cuts that are extra tender and delicious, Swift's Brookfield Sausage is then seasoned with rare, delicate spices that give you just the right blend of delicacy and zest you want. Not too spicy, not too mild, Swift's Brookfield Sausage is the sausage with the just right seasoning. It's just good reasoning to get the sausage with the just right seasoning. And now for our weekly visit to Riverdale. It's early evening as we look in on the Andrews' home, and we find Mrs. Andrews sitting in the living room sewing. When day is done and shadows fall, I see... Mom! Oh, Mom! Here I am, dear. Oh, hiya, Mom. Hello, dear. But there's something I want to ask you, Mom. Archie. It's very I'm... important, very, Archie. very important, so please say yes. Archie. Huh? Archie Andrews, how many times have I asked you not to slam the door when you come into the house and not to shout at the top of your lungs? Oh, gee, I'm sorry, Mom, but I got to ask you something. All right. Now, just what is it that's so important? Well, I just want to ask you... If... She was, Mom, where's Dad? Well, he isn't home yet, dear. He phoned to say he was detained at the office, but he'll be home any minute. Oh, well, what I was going to ask, Mom, is can we have a party here tonight? Of course you can. What? A party, a Halloween party. Tonight? Uh-huh. We were all set to have one at Veronica's house, but when Mr. Lodge heard about it tonight, he said nothing doing. Well, and if I can have the party here, it would really make a good impression on Veronica. But, Archie, I don't know what to say on such short notice. Well, gee, you don't have I to haven't... prepare anything, Mom. The but girls have the... all the candy and the cake and stuff at Veronica's now, and if you say yes, they'll bring everything right over here, and we'll clean well... up afterwards and be very careful. Please, Mom? <laughs> Well, if you put it that way, Archie, I don't see how I could say no. Oh, gee, thanks, Mom. I knew you'd say yes. Thanks a million, Mom. Thanks. Oh, oh you're such a... All right. All right, Archie. All right. You're quite welcome, dear. But if you're having company tonight, I'd better go change my dress. I'm sure you want your mother looking presentable. Oh, sure, Mom. And as soon as I call the kids and tell them everything's okay, I'll get dressed, too. Boy, oh, boy, we can have the Halloween party here. Hot dog. Mary, I'm home. Mary. Oh, that's funny. I wonder where she is. Oh, well, must be around the house someplace. Oh, boy, it sure feels good to be home. What a day. What a day. Oh, I don't know when this armchair looked so comfortable or felt so comfortable. Oh, it's good to be home. Yes, sir. I'll just take my tie off. Open my collar. Oh, there, that's better. Now I'll get these shoes off. Oh, now to sit back and relax. Yes, sir, it certainly feels good to be... Oh, Mr. Chughead, 
Who'd you expect? Elsa Maxwell? <laughs> no, Jughead, I did not expect Elsa Maxwell. And since when do you come barging in here without ringing the bell? Oh, why'd you just tell me to? We got a lot of things to do. You got a lot of things? To... What kind of things? Oh, no time to explain now, Mr. Andrews. Hey, I'm here! I'm here! Sydney, he's here. Oh, what the diggers is all this about, anyway? I Hello, don't... Mr. Andrews. Uh, Betty... What are you doing here? Oh, I just dropped in to see how... What am I doing? (laughs) Betty, dear, if you don't mind, I live here. Oh. Well, I'd better take these packages out into the kitchen. Yeah, but Betty, wait. What are those packages? Can't explain now, Mr. Andrews. Oh, great. First, Jughead comes marching in here without ringing the bell. Then Betty... Uh, Hello, Mr. Andrews. Daddy's probably here already, and she said... Oh, you're Mr. Andrews. Uh, yes, I'm Mr. Andrews, but who are you? I'm Agatha Gush. <laughs> and this is Prunella Jenkins and Sis Henderson and Bootsy Mitchell. Oh. <laughs> I'm glad to know you, girls. Oh, I... girls, isn't he cute? Yeah. <laughs> uh, look, Agatha, I... He'd be positively adorable if he only had hair. He <laughs> do. What do you mean, if only I had hair? Well, girl, let's see if Yeah, but wait a minute. What the devil's going on around here? I... Oh, great. Now, how do you like that? I spend a hard day at the office. I come home exhausted, and all of a sudden, my house is turned into Grand Central Station. Come on, I son. Never... We better get things I arranged. Never... So we... Gee whiz, Dad, what are you doing here? Why does everybody keep asking me that? Well, golly, Dad, I only meant I didn't know you were home. Archie, look, I am home and I'm beginning to wish I wasn't. Now, if it's not asking too much, would you mind telling me what's going on around here? Well, sure, Dad. We're having a Halloween party. Oh, all right. For a minute, I... A Halloween party? <laughs> uh-huh. We're going to dance. And play kissing games. Now, Archie, and sing I... songs. And play kissing Look, games. Archie, and listen I... to records. And play kissing games. <laughs> all right, Jughead. How many girls do you think you could kiss in one night? <laughs> <laughs> Great. Oh, brother, that's all. Frank, Archie, what are look, you I... doing here? That's all! Look, Mary, it so happens I live here. I pay the bills around here. I own the house here. That's what I'm doing here. Fred, don't be silly. I mean, what are you doing standing here in your stocking feet? Don't you know the children are having a Halloween party? Mary, I have news for you. The children are not having a Halloween party. Huh? She wish. Fred, what do you mean? Just what I said. I am tired. I have a slight headache. Nobody consulted me about this. And what's more, they could just go have their old party at somebody else's house. Oh, but Fred, you can't do that when they're... Mary, I haven't the slightest intention of spending the rest of the night out in the kitchen so a bunch of young jitterbugs can wreck the living room. This is definite and final. No party. Oh, but Fred... Of course, not to let us have the party there. Uh, the Andrews are awfully nice to let us have the party here. Oh, yes. Oh, hello, Mr. Andrews. Did we interrupt something? Uh, well, well, not a thing, Betty, not a thing. I, uh, I was just telling Archie I hoped his Halloween party would be a big success. Huh? <laughs> well, Mary, don't just stand there. Let's go out in the kitchen. Come on. <laughs> Well, Chuck, I guess everything's just about all set, and the rest of the kids should be here any minute. Yeah. And I want you to help me. Yeah. Help you? Help you what? Help me be host. Help me see that everyone has a nice time. Who's going to see that I have a nice time? Jug, you'll have a nice time being assistant host. But I want to talk to Agatha. She's supposed to be my date. After all, I even gave her a massage. Yes, I did. (laughs) Massage? Jughead, you mean a corsage. A what? A corsage. Oh, she doesn't wear one of those. She's too thin. (laughs) Jughead, not a corset, a corsage. Flowers. You gave Agatha some flowers. Yeah. And that mistletoe isn't cheap either. Yes, uh, mistletoe? Jughead, you gave Agatha a corsage of mistletoe? Sure. I'm no fool. (laughs) Oh, fine. Listen, Jug. Agatha will just have to wait till everyone gets here and we get... Hello, Archie. <laughs> oh, fine. Hi, you all, Archiekins. Mm. <laughs> 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 
It's awful nice to see you all, Archie. Do you? <laughs> Hello, Veronica. Gee, I see somebody gave you a massage, too. What? He means a corsage. And, Jug, I sent that to Veronica, so be quiet. Oh, okay, okay. Okay. Gee, Veronica, you sure look pretty tonight. Oh, do well, I? Well, hello, everyone. I'm here. Oh, fine. Reggie Mantle. Hi, y'all, Reggie. Well, if I believe what everyone tells me, I'm just wonderful. Oh, great. Reggie, are you seriously in love with yourself, or is it just a passing fancy? Now, Archie, remember, you're the host. Oh, Reggie, isn't that a new suit you're wearing? Yes, Veronica. Do you like it? Oh, yes, Reggie. It's lovely. Oh, you just say that because I'm wearing it. Oh, fine. Uh, Reggie, look, I'm glad to see you at our party. Come in and uh, make yourself at home. All right, Archie, don't mind if I do. Uh, fine. And now, Veronica, I... must I... say, Veronica, you're looking lovelier than ever. D huh? Oh, do you really think so, Reggie? Uh, Veronica, Of course I... I do, my dear. In fact, I'd say you're prettier than all the other girls who run after me. Oh, Reggie, how sweet. Uh, Veronica, But I... let's go sit down in the living room, Veronica, where we can have a nice long talk. Oh, oh but I... Right, Reggie, I'd love to. Uh, but, Veronica, wait, I want to talk to you. I just... I just... <laughs> now, how do you like that, Jug? I'm talking to Veronica, and that self-centered baboon comes in here and steals my girl right from under my nose. Now, watch you remember, a host is friendly, and a host is polite, and a host is cheerful. Yes, Jug, and I'm beginning to think a host is also a darn fool. Mary. Yes, dear. Mary, you know, I never realized before how uncomfortable these kitchen chairs are. <sighs> uh, how late do you think those kids are liable to stay? Oh, I've no idea. But, Fred, if you're getting restless, let's go to a movie. Oh, Mary, I'm too tired to go to a movie. Then go upstairs and go to sleep. Well, who can sleep with the noise those kids are making? Besides, maybe we should be out there. Out there? Uh-huh. You know, after all, as Archie's parents... Isn't it sort of our duty to make the kids feel at home and see that they have a good time? Well, I suppose we should. But then again, youngsters don't like to have old folks around at their parties. It makes them feel awkward and self-conscious. Mary, don't be silly. Nobody's going to be awkward because I'm there. But... As a matter of fact, those kids are probably having a terribly dull time right now. Well, <clears throat> I'll go out there and show them how to pep up the party. Come on. Well, all right, dear, if you think we should. Of course we should. And you'll see, Fred Andrews is always the life of the party. <laughs> yeah, we'll show them how to enjoy a party. Yes, dear. But they seem to be having a nice time right now. Well, yes, in a way, but... There's... Oh, there's Betty. Hello there, Betty. Oh, hello, Mr. Andrews. Hello, Mrs. Andrews. Well, hello, Betty. how is it uh, Charlie, going? Uh, uh, but, but, Betty, I wanted to... I, uh... Fred, she's gone. Yeah, yeah, she is, isn't she? Oh, there's Veronica. Hello, Veronica. Oh, hello, Mr. Andrews. Hello, Mrs. Andrews. Hello, hello Veronica. Veronica. How's things See going? See you both later. Uh, how, I, 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 uh, uh, well, <laughs> she seems to be pretty busy, too. I, oh, here's that Agatha girl. Oh, hello, Agatha. Oh, Mr. Andrews, <laughs> isn't he cute, girl? <laughs> oh. He just kills me. Cute? Fred, what does she mean, cute? Mary, I have no idea what she means by cute. But every time she sees me, she just goes into hysterics. <laughs> oh, Agatha always giggles. But Fred, I thought we were going to join the party. We can't just stand here all evening. Yeah, Mary, you're right. We can't just stand here, but neither can we join the party. What? Oh, Mary, I'm afraid there's only one place for old fogies like us. Back to the kitchen. Come on. Jug, have you seen Veronica? Oh, never mind. There she is. Veronica! Oh, hello, Archie. Oh, my goodness, this is a wonderful party. Oh, gee, I'm glad you like it. But listen, Veronica, I haven't seen you all evening. I want to talk to you. Well, Archie, of course you can talk to me. What did you want to say? Well, uh, it's awful noisy in here, Veronica. Let's go out on the porch. All right, Archie. I could use a breath of fresh air. Yeah, me too. Oh, and just look at that harvest moon. Yes. Oh, it's lovely, Archie. 
Simply lovely. Yeah. <laughs> Sit down, Veronica, and we can watch the moon for a while. All right. But it's a little chilly out here, isn't it? Oh, don't worry about that, Veronica. I'll put my arm around you. <laughs> there. That'll keep you warm. Oh, Archie. How sweet. Oh, it's nothing. Nothing at all. But Veronica. Yes, Archie? Now that we're alone, there's something I want to ask you. Yes, Archie? Well, would you mind if... Well, that is, may I... What I mean to say is, could I... Would you... What do you want to come out here for, Agatha? Oh, fine. Jug and Agatha. My goodness. You'll find out. And quick, Veronica, come on over here so they won't see us. But I don't... Oh, if that Agatha sees us, she'll start talking and they'll never go back inside. All right, Archie, but I hope they don't stay out here too long. I'm getting chilled. Oh, they won't quiet. Here they come. Gee whiz, it's cold out here, Agatha. Oh, it is not, Jughead. It's refreshing. Now, let's sit down for a while. Okay. But I sure wish I knew why you want to sit out here with all that cake and candy back in the house. Jughead, don't you really know? No. Well, I'll show you. Put your arms around me. Go ahead. Like this? Uh-huh. Hold me tighter. Okay. Tighter. Okay. Tighter. Okay. Not so tight! Oh. Gee, <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes, I... Don't know my own strength. Oh, I guess not. Now, turn your face to mine. Okay. Now, look me in the eye. Which one? <laughs> Either one. Now, hold me close. Okay. Now, what do you say? I know. What? Want some bubble gum? <laughs> Oh, for goodness sakes, Jughead, you're as romantic as a dish of popcorn. And personally, I'll take the popcorn. But Agatha, what did I say? Well, they're gone. Yes, I thought they'd never go in. Me too. Now, Veronica, where were we? Well, you were about to ask me something. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Veronica, as I was about to say, would you mind if... Oh, are you out? Oh, fine. Yes, Betty, I'm out here. Oh, oh, hello, Veronica. Hi. Archie, the kids want to roll back the rugs and move the furniture so we can dance. Well, you'll have to wait a while, Betty. I'm trying to talk to Veronica. But, Archie, it's not polite to keep your guests waiting. But, Betty, and I want to... the wanna... party will get dull if we don't start dancing. And you should keep it going. You're the host. Okay, okay, so I'm the host. But, Betty, the next time I throw a party, remind me not to. <laughs> Mary, I think those youngsters were absolutely rude to ignore us the way they did. Oh, Fred, they were just having a party. You didn't expect them to stop everything just to talk to us, did you? Well, when I was a boy, we showed respect for our parents. Party or no party. Well, times have changed, dear. So just read your newspaper and tell the youngsters to get tired and go home. All right, dear, all right. At least it's quiet out here, anyway. Mm. Let's see. That's it. Oh, fine. Get some water out here, Reggie. Well, I'm really thirsty. Oh, hello, Reggie. Oh, hiya, Miss Anders. Uh, Jug, get some ice cubes. I like my water cold. Okay. Wow. Look what we have here in the ice box. Cold chicken. Oh, boy, that looks good. Fred, did you hear that? Oh, yes, dear, I heard oh, it. Oh, my God. Fred, my chicken, that's for lunch tomorrow. Oh, Mary, don't hey, say look anything. Here. Just Fresh ready. apple pie. Oh, boy, that looks good. My pie. Fred, that's for dinner tomorrow night. Oh, I think. Hey, no, no, look no, what we got. Fred, oh, they're oh, raiding the oh, ice oh, box. Now, now, Mary, oh, now. Oh, well, Fred, stop. Yeah. Them. Well, I, Mary, there are only... My icebox shall take every last bit of food. Fred, what do we do? Mary, there's only one thing for us to do. Go down to the playroom in the basement. Come on. Well, so far, Archie's Halloween party seems to be a great success for everybody except Archie and Mr. and Mrs. Andrews. But we'll see how things turn out in a minute. Meanwhile, I have a suggestion for you. I'd like for you to compare Swift's Brookfield sausage critically with any other sausage on the market. And if you don't say it's the best-tasting sausage you ever put in your mouth, I'll eat my hat. Providing, of course, I can find a hat made of Swift's Brookfield sausage. 
made of pure fresh pork cuts that are carefully selected for their fine flavor and tenderness, Swift's Brookfield Sausage comes to you fresh daily from Swift kitchens all over the country. Then rare, delicate spices are added in just the right proportions so that Swift's Brookfield Sausage is not too mild, not too spicy, but just right. Ideal for a quick, easy-to-fix dinner, Swift's Brookfield Sausage also makes mighty fine eating at breakfast. For Swift's Brookfield Sausage adds plenty of needed nourishment to the morning meal. And that's important, because nutritionists say... You should get one-fourth to one-third of your daily nutritional requirements at breakfast. So, how about it, boys and girls? Do you want to eat better? Yeah! Feel better? Yeah! Do better? Yeah! Then eat Swift's Brookfield Sausage for breakfast. And now back to Archie's Halloween party. When Veronica couldn't have the party at her house, Archie talked Mrs. Andrews into letting him use the Andrews house, mainly to make a good impression on Veronica. But so far, he's been so busy being host, he hasn't had a chance to see much of Veronica. And meanwhile, Mr. and Mrs. Andrews are trying to find a quiet place to stay until the party's over. Okay, Betty, okay. Now the piano's out of the way, the couch is pushed back, the rug's rolled up, and everything's all set for dancing. Oh, thank you, Archie. That's fine. Good. Come on, everybody. I'm going to play the piano, and everybody dance. <sighs> well, now that that's settled, maybe I can get a dance with Veronica for all my troubles. Oh, Archie, I... this dance is mine. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Agatha, yours. Oh, but Agatha, I, I want... I just love dancing with you, Archie. <laughs> Yes, Agatha, but I want to see if I... Oh, there's the music. Come on, let's dance. Oh, me, all right, Agatha. Let's dance. Oh, golly, Archie. Isn't this the most wonderful party? Oh, sure, Agatha, sure. But you know something? What? If I didn't live here, I'd go home. Fred, the way those children just raided that icebox without asking anyone's permission was absolutely rude. Oh, now, Mary, dear, just forget it. That's how youngsters are, you well, know. And there's nothing we can do about it anyway. Now, just be thankful it's quiet down here in the basement. We can sit here peacefully until those kids go home. Oh, yes, dear, you're right. But they can't leave any too soon for me. Yes, dear. Now, let's see. What was I reading in this newspaper? Oh, yes, dear. There was... Mary, what's that? Fred, I don't know. Sounds like an earthquake or the house is falling down. Or... Fred, I know what it is. What? We're directly under the living room. The children must be dancing. Oh, all right. For a minute, I was afraid. Dancing? What kind of dancing is that that makes that much noise? Fred, you know how the youngsters jitterbug, jump up and down, and throw each other around. Yes, but do they have to do that to my house? The whole house is shaking. Fred, the youngsters are entitled to dance if they want yeah, but to. They you can't, can't stop them from doing yeah, that. But so they just can't. make the best of it and read your paper. Oh, me. All right, dear, all right. First, we went out into the kitchen. Then we came down to the cellar. You'd think there'd be one place we could go in our own house where we could just what? <laughs> Ye gods, Mary, what was that? Oh, dear. A big piece of the ceiling came down. The ceiling? Mary, come on. Fred, where can we go now? There's just one place, Mary, one place. To the living room to put an end to this nonsense. Come on. Yes, Agatha, it was fine. Now, if you don't mind, I want to ask Veronica for the next dance. Veronica? But don't you want to dance with me anymore? Well, yes, Agatha, but oh, I, I feel that as the host, I should ask Veronica. And oh, oh, here she is now. Veronica? Yes, Archie? Can I have the next dance? Oh, Archie, I just promised it to Reggie. Reggie? Oh. Listen, Veronica, how come all night long you're talking to Reggie, dancing with Reggie, laughing with Reggie? Well, Archie, you knew Reggie was my date for tonight, didn't you? Well, sure, and Reggie is your date for tonight. You mean I threw this party and you brought... Anything wrong with my being her date? I'll say there is. I can't hey, under... somebody else play the piano now. I want to dance. Betty, please, just a minute. Veronica, did you... I've seen Agatha. 
Uh, Jughead, please. Archie, can I have you for a minute, please? Well, just one minute, Dad. I want to get something straight here. Veronica, you mean you brought Reggie Mantle as your date to my party? Archie, uh-huh. I... You never asked me to be your date. Veronica, Archie, would you please... I'm going to dance this next Betty, day. let's not... I'll play the piano. Agatha, oh, please. please. Oh, I dance. Jughead, Fred, don't you... make a scene. Well, Mary, I'm not making a scene. Please, I'm trying to talk to Veronica. Agatha, please stop playing that piano. Look, Mary. Agatha. Archie. Why? Agatha, you be quiet, too. Yes, now, listen to me, all of you. This nonsense has gone far enough. Too far, in fact. Yes, Mr. Andrew. Yes, dear. Yes, Dad. Uh-huh. <laughs> now, I, I certainly am the last one to object to youngsters having a Halloween party. But this is going too far. Much too far. You kids come in here like you own the place. You raid the icebox without asking. Shove all the furniture around. Scrap up the scratch up a perfectly good floor. Break the ceiling in the basement with your jumping and stamping. And who knows what else you've done. I know. <laughs> Chug, be quiet. Now, I hate to be so harsh, but I'm afraid you young jitterbugs have to be taught some manners. And if you have anything to say for yourselves, I want to hear it. Well, yes, Dad, we do have something to say. But would you excuse me for just a minute? There's something I want to ask the other kids. You certainly may. Uh, hey, fellas, come here a minute. Yeah. Now, look, my dad says some of the ceiling down the hall, so don't you think we ought to... Yeah, I can... Okay, with you? Okay, fellas, thanks. Uh, Dad? Well, Archie, go on. Go on. Well, first, all the fellas want me to apologize for their getting a little wild. I should think they would. The apology is accepted. And we hope that this money will make up for the damage we did. Well, I should hope it... Money... What money? This money here, Dad. We all just chipped in to pay for the scratched floor and the broken ceiling. Well, I, I know it isn't very much money, but it's all we had. About three dollars, I think, and a little change. Archie. Yes, Dad? You mean to say that your, your friends chipped in that money to pay for the damage you did? Well, yes, Dad. Well, Archie, there's only one thing I can say. Yes, Dad? If that's the kind of friends you have, I'd be a pretty mean old sourpuss to take that money or to stop the party. Happy Halloween, kids. Come on, Mary, let's dance. Listen to those wonderful Swift's Brookfield sausages sizzling in the skillet. Man, there's an appetizing aroma floating through the kitchen, and it's an invitation to enjoy Swift's Brookfield sausage. For energy to get you up and pep to keep you going, eat Swift's Brookfield sausage. In link or in bulk, it's the sausage with the just right seasoning. And while you're at your dealers, be sure to look for Swift's Premium Franks. Made of all dinner quality meat, Swift's Premium Franks are wrapped in cellophane to keep them extra fresh and delicious. Your dealer also has a tempting variety of Swift's Premium Table-Ready Meats. Delicious pickle and pimento loaf is being featured this week, and you'll find it just the thing for lunches, quick suppers, and late evening snacks. Now back to the Andrews. It's many hours later and the big Halloween party's all over and everybody, including Mr. and Mrs. Andrews, had a fine time. Oh, gee, Dad. That was a swell party, wasn't it? <laughs> yes, son, it certainly was. Yes, you seem to be enjoying yourself, I noticed. Yeah, meaning what? Meaning where did you learn to ditter bug like that? Oh, Agatha taught me. And you know something? Agatha's cute. Hey, oh, gee. Oh, gee. Fred yeah. Andrews, you should be a shame. <laughs> You've been listening to another chapter of The Adventures of Archie Andrews, written by Carl Jampel and based on the copyrighted feature appearing in Archie Comics magazine. Archie was played by Bob Hastings, Jughead by Harlan Stone. Mom and Dad Andrews are played by Alice Ureman and Arthur Cole. Veronica and Betty by Gloria Mann and Rosemary Rice. Others in the cast were Pat Hosley and James Dobson. This program is produced and directed by Kenneth McGregor. Listen next Saturday when we bring you more of the merry adventures of Archie Andrews. This is Bob Sherry wishing you all a very pleasant weekend. So long. Welcome back to Yesterday Today. Um, uh, you know, you hear that thumping? Sydney's inside the walls. 
He's, uh, I don't... This is honestly much preferable to having him outside the walls. So apparently what he told me was that ghosts will sometimes inhabit the spaces between spaces, and he apparently that translates to I need to get inside the walls and start knocking on them. Look, I don't know, man. So if I, like, responded to his poundings and, like, hit the wall back, do you think he'd have a heart attack? Don't encourage him, McLean. That's how we got into this mess in the first place. Yeah, I'm gonna do it. Yeah, I, I think that did it. Um, I, I might have You, you might have literally just killed him. The last show we have for you today is an episode of Escape, a classic episode of Escape. This is the one people talk about, well, one of the ones people talk about when they talk about classic radio. This is Three Skeleton Key. Tired of the everyday routine? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape! Escape! Designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Tonight, we escape to a lonely lighthouse off the steaming jungle coast of French Guiana and a nightmare world of terror and violence as we bring you again in response to hundreds of requests Three Skeleton Key starring Vincent Price Picture this place a gray tapering cylinder welded by iron rods and concrete to the key itself. A bare black rock, 150 feet long, maybe 40 wide. That's at low tide. At high tide, just the lighthouse rising 110 feet straight up out of the ocean. And all about it, the churning water. Gray, green, scum dappled, warm as soup. And swarming with gigantic bat-like devilfish. Great violet schools of Portuguese man of war, and yes, sharks, the big ones, the 15 footers. And as if this weren't enough, there was a hot, dank, rotten smelling wind that came at us day and night off the jungle swamps of the mainland. A wind that smelled like death. A wind that had smelled the slow and frightful death that came one night to this bare black rock. <laughs> Set in the base of the light was a watertight bronze door. And in you went. And up. Yes, up and up and round and round. Past the tanks of oil and the coils of rope, casks of wicks, racks of lanterns, sacks of spuds and cartons and cans. And up. And up and up. Round and round. Over the light storeroom was the food storeroom, and over the food storeroom was the bunk room where the three of us slept. And over the bunk room was the living and cooking room, and over the living and cooking room was the light. She was a beauty, big steel and bronze baby with the sun gleaming through the glass walls all about, bouncing blinding little beams off the big shining reflectors, glittering and refracting through her lenses, the whole gigantic bulk of her balanced like a ballerina on the glistening steel axle of her rotary mechanism. She was a sweetheart of a light. And at night she'd lie there on the stone deck of the gallery with her revolving smoothly and quietly over your head, easing her bright white eye 360 degrees around the horizon. You'd lie there watching to see that the feeders kept working, that everything ran right. And it wouldn't be bad, the other two fellows snoring in their sacks two levels down. You'd smoke your pipe to kill the stink of the wind, and it wouldn't be bad. About those other two, Louis and Auguste, what a pair. Louis, he was head man, was a big fellow from the Basque country, black beard, Little hard black eyes and a pair of arms that I tell you those arms were as big around as my legs. Yes, head man he was, and what word he let go was law. 
a silent fellow, and although I spent my first two weeks trying to strike up a real conversation, the most I could ever get out of him was... Jean, I took up this profession because I don't like people. They want to talk too much. It's quiet work, light tending. Let's keep it that way. You, you're getting to be as bad as August. I thought maybe for once they send me somebody... Who that was Louis. Shut. When he accused me of becoming like August, I quieted down. Because August was the talkingest man I'd ever met. The talkingest and the ugliest. He was hunchbacked, stood four feet high, had red hair and big blue eyes. It seems he'd been an actor in Paris. Yes, indeed. Played in over 200 different productions, dear boy, at the Grand Guignol. Oh, but it was monstrous horrible, the way we used to scare the audiences. I, I was hated. Yes, yes, they used to throw things and hiss and bare their teeth at me. Finally, it got too bad. I couldn't stand it any longer. I gave up the theater. My nerves, you understand, yes? Gave it up completely. I really did. Couldn't stand it any longer. It all started one morning at 2.30. I was on watch, lying on the cool stone deck, pulling on my pipe, staring out at the blackness, the phosphorescent combers, and the big yellow stars, when out of the corner of my eye, I noticed something show up for a second, something the light had touched, far off. I waited for her to come around again, and when she did, there it was. A big one, about a half mile off and coming down out of the north-northwest, coming straight for us. You must understand, our light was where it was for a very good reason. Dangerous submerged reefs surrounded us and ships kept clear. But this one, this sailing vessel, was coming straight on. I went over to the gallery door and yelled, Glory! Glory! Couldn't understand it. I waited for the light to come around again. What? Ship headed for the reef. Hurry right up. I had the glasses off now. I couldn't read her name, but I could see her quite plainly. All sails set, the foam creaming away under her bow, her beautiful lines. A Dutch ship, I guessed her. But why didn't she turn? Every time it passed, our light hit her with the glare of day. Ship? Where? North, northwest. The light will touch her in a moment. Can't they see? Look at her. She just keeps coming on. Yeah, the square head. What is it? What is it? Watch north, northwest. I know. I know what it is. Huh? What? The Dutchman. The flying Dutchman. We did a play about her once. Oh, what a performance. You ghastly, gallian, hag-ridden, cursed ribbon. Must all... Shut have... up, will you? She's loving. Yes. Sloppy way to come about. She's derelict, that's it. Derelict? Abandoned. The crew left her for some reason or other. But instead of sinking, she's gone on, running before every wind. She'll not run long. Not with these reefs to break her up. A beautiful ship. Now, why would men leave a beautiful ship like that? She didn't ram us, although we all expected it. But as we waited for the crash, she luffed again, caught some odd gust, and went about. We watched her the rest of those black hours, heeling and rocking, pushed and pulled by every stray wind, every freak current. Watched her until the dawn came, till the sea turned from black to a pearly gray. And on she came again, heading for us. We all had our glasses trained on her now. August, you can kill the light. Right, Chief? Yeah, she doesn't look so good by daylight. Think she'll ground this time? What? I say, do you think she'll ground this time? Hmm? This is impossible. Huh? Absolutely impossible. What? Here. Take my glasses. They're better than yours. All right. And what is it you... I had to focus, and then my breath froze in my throat. The decks were swarming with a dark brown carpet that looked like a gigantic fungus, but undulating. And on the masts and yards, the guys and all were hundreds, no thousands, no mi I don't know, an endless number of enormous rats. See them? Yes, I see them. Now we know why she's derelict. Yes, now we know. What are you two doing? Here, give me a look. 
Yes, give him the glasses. Take a good look, chatterbox. Give you something to talk about. She's still heading for us. Yes. Uh, She's going to turn. She better turn soon. Uh, suppose she doesn't. You mean suppose she piles up on the key? It's slow tide. Yes. Yes, it is. Where's all the conversation, August? Huh? Here, want the glasses again? Uh, want another look? No, no. She's still coming on. Go away! Go away! Turn, will you? Turn, I say, I pray you! Turn! She's cracking up. The rats! Look! On the water! Like a carpet! They're swimming. Sure, they're swimming. Those are ship's rats. But they're swimming for the rocks. The door below! It's open! Come on! Down we went, racing down the stone stairs, taking them three and four at a time. Scared? You bet we were scared. August, you get the windows. Maybe they can climb. We don't know. Gracie, but hurry, hurry! Look. See them? No. Oh, yes, I do. Up at the other end of the rock. Look at the them. millions. They smell us. Here they come. Uh, Close the door. Can't it, can't it. Yeah. Let me. Oh, move, you move. He made it. Holy. That was close. One guy in. Look, there. Get him. He's kicking. He's as big as a turtle. Bigger. And his eyes were wild and red, his teeth long and sharp and yellow. He went for us, hard and ravenous, and we fought him, fought that one rat all over the room. It was, oh, believe me, I do not exaggerate, it was like fighting a panther. Got him. Yeah. We better get aloft. As we ran up the winding staircase, we passed the tiny windows of the various levels. And at every one was a thick, wriggling, screaming curtain of brown fur. I was ahead of Louie, and I dreaded each successive level. Suppose they had found a way in. Look at them. Will you look at them? It's a nightmare. Will you look at them? The air of the gallery was thick and fetid with the stink of them. The light was dim, brown, filtered through the crawling mass that swarmed over the glass all about us. I could not see the sky. Nothing, nothing but them. Their red eyes, their claws, their wriggling, hairy snouts, and their teeth, the rats. They screamed and howled and threw themselves against the glass. They were starving. And we three, we stood very quietly. Oh, very, very quietly in the center of the classroom under our beautiful light. And we waited. What can we do? What can we do? Take it easy, old man. Take it easy. I can't. I just can't. It won't do any good to stand here and shake. Uh, that's right. Anybody want a cigarette? Yes. Yes, I have one. Thank you. Good boy. We've got to keep calm about this thing. Here's a light. <laughs> they don't like the fire, do they? Guess not. <laughs> Give me another match. <laughs> You don't like that much, do you like Don't that? rile them, August. <laughs> Give me some more matches. I'll strike them and strike them and strike them until they get scared and go away. They won't <laughs> go away. Not until... Let me see, Jim. Not until what? Not until they've been fed. take just so much horror and then you get used to it. And they were interesting to watch, you know. They couldn't understand the glass. They could see us and they could rush at us, but that thin, invisible barrier held them off, stopped them. From time to time, we caught a glimpse of the rocks below. More rats down there, swarming brown velvet in the bright tropical sunlight. And then the tide began to rise. If only it had drowned some of them. Ships rats don't drown. <laughs> no, sir, you cannot drown one of them. They're all climbing up the tower. This bunch around us is getting thicker. Yeah. Say, what's the time? Quarter six. You've got first watch, John. Right. Uh, wake me at ten. I will. Come along, August. 
was getting dark. One side of the room was lit a soft, filtered red. Sunset through the rats. Oh, very pretty. I set the wicks, checked my fuel, and then lit the lamp. It caught them. Lit them in their gigantic, wriggling web of pale, hairless bellies, twitching red tails, bright eyes. Then I started the rotary motor. Life drove them mad as she swung slowly and smoothly about. She blinded them in the fierce, stabbing bar of light, moving continually about of a turning, of a touching, of a moving around and around. And they twitching and shuddering, eyes flaming when they were struck by the light. The bright light moving and behind on the dark side of the room, so close, so close, I dared not turn my back, but you cannot help turning your back when you're in a room made of glass. On the dark side of the room, you could not see them, but only their eyes. Thousands of points of blank red light blinking and twinkling like the stars of hell. Louis relieved me at ten, but I didn't get much sleep that night, and when I came up into the gallery early next morning... There stood August, his back to me. He was bowing to the rats, waving his arms and making a speech. I am going to play once again that magnificent role which made me the toast of the Paris theater. Prelate, the evil genius of the medieval underworld. I am he who did guide the dark soul of the Marechal into the nether parts. <laughs> Do not be frightened, little children. I will he not hurt turning. you. I much. stood staring at him, horror struck. But he didn't notice me. The man had gone mad. He kept turning, telling his stories to all the rats, leaving no one out. August! August! Ah, another one. A latecomer. Take a seat on the aisle, dear patron. August! Move stop over it, there. Stop it. Let the gentleman be but seated. He didn't. Come, come. He went on, bowing and scraping to the rats, his big blue eyes rolling and winking, his wild red hair waving about him. I grabbed him by the arm. Slapped his face. He looked at me like a child. And then his face screwed up. He looked as though he were about to cry. Go below, go on. Oh, very well, then. Later, my dear audience, later. Matinee today. Sure, he was crazy. But I guess we all were. A few hours later, he came back up and caught Louie and me teasing the rats. Yes. Sounds horrible. <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> We could get right up against the glass and make faces at them. It drove them crazy. They would scratch away trying to get at our eyes. Louie was even cuter about it. He'd pull a piece of bread out of his pocket and press it against the glass. The rats would scramble into a solid ball, biting each other, clustering like grapes. From time to time, a whole knot of them would slip and fall 110 feet to the surf below. Sharks. They're eating them. Yeah, the sharks are our friends. Here, here. I'll get another bunch together. Here, my beauty. That's it. Pile of kill each other. There they go. Auguste joined in, too. Oh, very ingenious, Auguste. He learned that if he spread eagled himself against the glass, they'd bunch and bundle against his figure. Then he'd leap back. Look! My portrait in rats. It went on all day. And then I was lying in bed. It was about midnight. I was very tired and I was just beginning to fall off to sleep when I became conscious of a new sound. Couldn't figure it at first. I got up, lit the lamp and went to the window. Even as I looked at it, I saw one of the panes begin to sag in. They had eaten the wood away. Louis, Louis, come uh, quick. What? Well, what is it? They found a way in. I held the glass with my hand. Now they were all going crazy and assured of the success of this maneuver, were all nibbling away at the wood. Louis ran below and then returned with a large sheet of tin. We spread it against the window and hammered it into place. 
Even as we did so, we felt the heavy body scudding against the other side as the window gave way. That ought to hold. If it doesn't, we're done for. Rats can't eat tin. No, they can't. So what was that? I don't know. It came from below. The storeroom window. They're in. They're swarming up the stairs. Drop the trap. Right. Two of them got in. Let's go after them. We didn't have to go after them. They came at us. I leaped to one side and grabbed a marlin spike, swung and smashed one in midair. No! I whirled to see Louie with the other. It had ripped his hand open and the blood was pouring all over the place. He held his hand aloft and kicked at the snarling rat. I stepped and swung and got him. My hand! He got my hand! That's both of them, Louie. I'll I'll get you something to tie that up. Blood! Look at it, my... My blood! I'm bleeding! Now, don't worry about it, Louie. Here, look. I'll, I'll wind this kerchief around it. It'll be okay. Blood! There, now. It's not bad. Just the flesh. And then I became conscious of another new sound. They were gnawing their way through the wooden trap door. I watched the wood fascinated. Even as I did, it began to give way. And a bristling, whiskery nose showed through... Louis, Louis, we've got to go up. Next level was the living quarters in the kitchen. I slammed the trap door there, too. But it, too, was wood. Uh, my blood. What are we going to do? I don't know. We'll be through this one in a moment. The gallery. The trap door in the gallery is metal. Good. Come on. We made it. Across the trap door exhausted. While below us, the rats took over the entire tower. I could hear them howling and fighting over our food supply, our water, our leather. And all about us, the others screamed and glared in at us, swayed in a tangled mass, hypnotized by the ever turning light. By morning, the air in the little room was horrible. Until now, we'd been getting air from the tower below. Now that was sealed off. And so was all our food and water. We lay exhausted, panting, waiting, waiting. The hours crawled on. I was almost dozing from fatigue when I saw a sight that brought me too fast. <laughs> Would you like to come in, my beauty? Would you? I hold the powers of life and death, and I can let you in, you know. August was standing by the glass, and in one hand he held a wrench. He was tapping the glass gently, not quite hard enough to break it. I eased myself to my feet, and slowly, very slowly, tiptoed toward him. All I have to do is tap just a little harder. Who? As a... I found a coil of wire in the tool kit and I trussed him up, fastened him to a stanchion in the center of the room. Louis was of no help. He lay on his side looking at his bloody hand, weak and sick as a baby. So there I was, a lunatic and a coward for company, and all about watching our little drama, The Rats. <laughs> supply boat wasn't due for another 12 days. I don't know what they could have done if they had come. We had only one way of summoning them, and that was to shoot off distress rockets, but the rockets were four floors below. And even if they'd been right there in the gallery, I couldn't have opened a window to fire them. That night, I tended the light, but its flame was devouring our oxygen. The following day, we lay, thirst-tormented, starving, waiting, waiting, and the following night, I again tended the light, but the small supply of spare wicking we kept in the gallery had become exhausted, and quite suddenly, about midnight, the light went out. There was nothing I could do. Wicks were stored three levels below. Nothing I could do. Nothing... From time to time, I'd strike a match to see the clock. When I did, it lit up the million red eyes about us. All about us. Watching. Waiting. 
Below, it had grown quiet. They'd cleaned us out, and now they, too, were waiting, all waiting. And then the rats, quite suddenly, were silent. And then I heard it. And then I saw the sky and the stars... The rats were gone. I went to the glass. Out there on the water, a small freighter, a banana boat, showing a few lights, came softly and innocently at us. The light was out. They didn't know. I wanted to open the windows to call out to them, to warn them somehow, but I was afraid. What if the rats were hiding from me, tricking me? So I waited. She grounded very softly on a reef not 200 yards from the quay. Grounded so gently that the man playing the cornet, was he a passenger or crew man off watch, didn't even stop playing. They tried washing her back off. I could have told them to save their fuel. The tide was rising, would have floated her free. And I waited. That's all. That's the story. The sun came up and there wasn't a rat on the whole key. Every last one of that terrible army had left us, gone back to sea on their new ship. August, insane asylum, he never recovered. And Louis, they took him into Cayenne where he died of blood poisoning from his bite. Uh, oh, yes. Oh, well, that's the whole of it. And if you'll excuse me now, I must go set my traps. No, no mouse traps. No rats in this lighthouse, I should say not. Life in the lights isn't bad. But sometimes when I see a strange vessel approaching, I get a little nervous, sure. Somewhere on the seas, there's a little banana boat without a crew. That is, without a human crew. Escape is produced and directed by William N. Robeson. Tonight we have presented Three Skeleton Key by George Tadeus, adapted for radio by James Poe and starring Vincent Price as Jean. Supporting Mr. Price were Harry Bartell as August and Jeff Corey as Louis. Sound effects on Three Skeleton Key, created by Cliff Thorsness and executed today by Mr. Thorsness, Gus Bays, and Jack Sixsmith, have been awarded the best of the year by Radio and Television Life magazine. Harry Essman was at the control panel, and special music was arranged and conducted by Del Castillo. Next week... You are swimming for your life in the dangerous waters off the Florida Gulf Coast, about to be smashed by a launch carrying a vicious criminal who must kill you or die himself. And on shore 500 yards away... The police are waiting to arrest you for murder. And there can be no escape. And so, the Snort Hop investigation continues with the case of the haunted studio. Did we find the ghost today? Maybe. You didn't... You didn't. Uh, you didn't, Sydney. That was McLean knocking on the wall. Okay, look, listen, buddy. If you're gonna be like that, I don't need you on my podcast. I don't want any skeptics in here casting aspersions on us legitimate ghost hunting individuals. I suppose this was so important to you, I guess. Important to me, important to the world, important to every living being on this earth. I'll have you now. Anyway, um, don't lock the door when you leave because I'm gonna be huddled over there under the desk with a tape recorder and a weather radio. 
That's reasonable. For the next three yeah. or so weeks. Now, now I have some unbridged. Sydney, uh, we, this is, you can't huddle in the space that we rent for three weeks. Actually, as a janitor, I can technically do whatever I want whenever I want as long as it falls into the auspices of janitorial work. And I'd say cleansing the building of spooks. That is the purest janitorial work of them all. I'm off, folks, to the ghost mobile. That's what I'm calling my scooter now. I think it's pretty fitting. Anyway, toodaloo. Toodaloo, Sydney. Yes, you're there, folks. Uh, join us next week for more... Spooky Halloween Shocktober month. We need a name for this man, I don't know. Sydney's a crafty fellow, let me tell you.